Hello and welcome. I'm Vanita Dahir presenting on motor neuron disease, also known as MND. Now, MND is a rather debilitating disease. You either learn to live with it and learn not to die from it because all central mechanisms start to decline. The awareness of MND has been made through various forms of media, like a movie called Theory of Everything, um, or the various fundraising initiatives called the Ice Bucket Challenge. But I guess the most prevalent association of motor neuron disease is Stephen Hawking. He had lower motor neuron disease, or he had motor neuron disease that affected his lower motor neurons first, and he was on a ventilator. And there was a beautiful uh, gentleman, Dr. Justin Ubery. He was from the University of Wollongong who met Stephen Hawking, and he developed what we call the eye gaze technology to actually type up uh, the software program that converts them into computerized voice. And Stephen Hawking had communicated in this way since 1985. Now the statistics of MND is about two to three per hundred thousand and of those about 10% are inherited. It's a baffling disease. It's from diagnosis to death is approximately two to three years and it affects the neural systems as well as the muscular system. So it's a neurological disease. It, I guess the first record of MND was uh, also known as Shark's disease in France and that was in the 1870s. Now what causes MND? There are many postulations. There's no direct cause of MND. One of the postulated theories is the existence of a toxin called blue-green algae. Now this stuff is, uh, there are huge plumes in Australia alone, there's stretches of these blue-green algae across the Murray River, um, across the Murrumbidgee Rivers, in the Hunter Valley, in Victoria. And what these algae do, they, um, they initiate cell suicide or cell death by misfolding these proteins, which are then associated with neurodegenerative disorders. They get into all kinds of foodstuffs, into fish, crustaceans, seeds of trees, uh, particularly the cycad seeds. Now this algae is mimics what they do. This culprit, the toxin that it mimics is called BMAA, standing for B beta methyl amino L alanine. It's found in unwashed cycad seeds. Um, so there are various population groups. They, they consume cycad flour. And traditionally, uh, there are various uh, populations in the key peninsula in Japan or Western Papua New Guinea, uh, or even our Aborigines, they used these cycad flour. But they would wash the, the seeds uh, and prepare it before they use it. So they've experienced they're clusters of these population groups that have experienced ALS or MND. So this particular blue-green algae, algae is actually um, caused by agricultural runoff from pesticides and fertilizers, and it's known to kill livestock. Uh, people have low levels of exposure of BMAA over a long period, and it can take between 10 and 15 years before the condition actually appears. But from time of diagnosis to death, it can be really quick, up to three years. So our aboriginals um, and uh, the Camoros, uh, they relied on these seeds to make their flour for tortillas and dumplings, but the unwashed flour contained the poison. So bats ate these seeds and there's high levels of BMAA as well. So they bioconcentrate in our food chains. BMAA has been found in the brain tissue of um, ALS patients and Alzheimer's patients. And uh, Dr. Paul Cox has reported in his studies that populations in Guam had 50 to 100 times more incidences of um, MND. 
Now, the other causes have also been postulated and the race is really on to discover all these genes as we're becoming more and more aware of genetics. There are quite a few, because 10% of them may be uh, hereditary, so gene mutations, germline or acquired muta um, immunity is identified. So these germline mutations are present in the patient's uh, in the patient's um, or the parent egg or sperm cells um, or the acquired or somatic mutations, they only present in certain cells. So we know that 90% of MND patients are not genetic, but 10 have an autosomal dominant gene disposition. There are organizations called Implicit Bioscience. So they have um, various sequencing facilities available to identify um, the particular gene uh, SNPs. 90% of the patients with MND have um, sporadic MND. And in 1993, the first genetic mutation, SOD, superoxide dismutase 1, was related to MND. And now in this in this particular decade, there are many, many more genes that have been identified, TAR DNA, TPD43, and a number of others. New genes such as C21, ORF2 as well. A lot of money is being spent, and there are a number of phase two trials in place right now. Dr. Justin Yerbury uh, used, uh, he's, he's been well published. Do have a look at some of his work. Um, the gene marker uh, C9, ORF72 gene is um, found in about 40% of families with familial MND. So MND, basically you're getting this protein clogging, clogging up of the cell, the protein buildup. So these toxins, when they migrate, all these genes are particularly active and they're expressed during this time, and really during early development, before birth, and when the tissues are actually forming. So many of these proteins whose production is influenced, it can be influenced by TPD43 protein, and they're involved in this nervous system and organ um, development. What are the assessment options for MND? We know that they are functional rating scales. That's a questionnaire. But there are a number of blood tests. One of the first things we look at is creatinine, kina creatine kinase. Um, there are nerve conduction studies, electromyographies, MRIs, magnetic resonance imagery. Um, and, and also you, under, you have a look at the strength of the grip. The nerve conduction study involves actually taping electrodes of the nerves and recording the muscle activity when the nerves are stimulated by these electromagnetic impulse, electrical impulses. Electromyography or EMG involves inserting a needle electrode into the muscles to measure the electrical activity. Um, and so, and they're blood tests that identify um, either genetics and neurofilaments. Now, there are many types of diseases that mimic the action or mimic that of MND. ALS, also known as amylotropic lateral sclerosis, is um, rather common. AL, uh, ALS is, um, causes damage to the upper and the lower motor neurons where you'll see muscle weakness, loss of speech, difficulty in swallowing, uh, fatigue and weight loss. And the life expectancy is a little bit more than that of MND patients, up to five years. But then there are other conditions such as SMA, spinal muscular atrophy, where the lower motor neurons are affected. That affects children from birth to the age of two. And the unusual amino acid that is found in these SMA patients is called ODAP, which is a diamino propionic acid derivative. So there are variations of those sorts of conditions. Now, the symptoms that are associated with MND are mainly neurological. So you might see paralysis. It's in a relentless disease, and it's also sporadic. So it can, it can ebb and flow in terms of severity of symptoms. Pain is generally a secondary feature, but you will see stiffness. Um, the signals, basically the signals 
to the cortex is altered and it alters the communication. And so as a result, all nerve associated um, mechanisms are affected, leading to choking when, when eating, coughing, growling, gagging or drooling, and this leads to respiratory distress, hoarseness, and a whole bunch of um, symptoms that are associated with the lower and upper motor neurons. So the management of MND is, involves multidisciplinary care. Often a patient re is required to have, um, you know, 24-hour care. Uh, the treat, you need to treat the uh, salivation, peg feeding because they can't swallow. You might have to look at peg feeding, can't breathe. You might need to look at uh, ventilation. Now, there are many, many trials that are on uh, the go right now. The European Federation of Neuro Neurological Sciences, their, their task force, um, American Academy of Neurology, uh, the Cochrane Library, they've all reported on a number of trials. Some drugs are in phase two, such as telampinol, tamoxifen, minocycline, minomycin. Minocycline is actually an antibiotic that's used quite um, uh, commonly today. Uh, but then we're looking at phenylbutyrate, gabapentin, uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone, um, and then there are other agents. The other agents are are uh, still in trial um, and they are listed down the bottom. They're probably ones that are memantine, which is um, um, associated with uh, brain function, uh, celestrol and so forth. So there's a number of these trials that are on the go at the moment. Some of the new frontiers within MND research may involve the use of antisense oligonucleotides. They basically, they first generation um, ge uh, prescriptions to treat, uh, I guess it was first used to treat viral replication, mainly cyclomegalovirus, CMV. So an organization called Biogen uh, have... Um, I think registered a product called um, Etiplerizin, also marketed as Spinraza. So there's a few things that are on the market at the moment. In 2016, a, um, a repurposed HIV drug called Trumeg has also been um, researched. So these are under research or um, and and being reported in the literature at the moment. What we know uh, that is available right now is Riluzole or Rilutec. It's a glutamate blocking agent. It is licensed basically. One of the first studies were based on the hypothesis that glutamate excitotoxicity contributes to this neuronal death in your ALS and MND patients. And Riluzole being the glutamate inhibitor. Rilizel is currently the only medication approved uh, by regulatory authorities, but there are other, uh, memantine being one of them, uh, and um, other prescription agents that are also working along the same metabolic pathway. So the idea is to modulate the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA using GABA modulators such as gabapentin, Etc., and their varying effects thereof. Another phase two trial is your um, squamoline. It's an anti cancer and an antiviral. Um, and Edoverone, originally marketed for stroke patients. Mastinib is combined with uh, approved ALS drug like Lurizol, so they combine therapy. Um, and CK. 2127107 is um, on respiratory function for patients with ALS. Minocycline it has potential therapeutic agents. Lithium, low-dose lithium, we know that is uh, is been well touted uh, in the marketplace for a number of therapeutic agents, uh, particularly mental health patients. But lithium in patients with ALS is in a phase three trial at the moment. 
The treatment options, other treatment options that are available are ciliary neurotropic factor. Uh, it's a growth factor. Your insulin-like growth factor. These, these neurotropic factors are shown to promote new motor neuron survival in cell cultures, um, particularly in rodents. They're testing them in rodents at the moment. And then including a slowing of the disease progression. And it does this by improving the muscle strength in these wobbler mice as well. Um, it's identified in a couple of uh, randomized control trials. Now, the amino acids have been playing such a great role because, as we know, BMAA is actually an amino acid toxin. And we find that there is, uh, we know that MND is associated with an elevation of cerebrospinal fluid glutamate. So therefore, and we also see abnormal glycine metabolism in your MND patients. So the level of glycine and its metabolite like alanine were higher in these MND patients than in, in neurological controls. So it is important to understand where these amino acids are. So glutamate analogs are things like NOLA, which is N oxalal amino L alanine. It's implicated in your encephalopathic syndromes. Um, and these are toxins, right? So the action of glutamate, glutamate acts on three major receptors, and NMDA being the main one, AMPA and KA. And these, they appear to be dependent on the ones that are attaching glutamate attaching to NMDA receptors are glycine dependent. So the sorts of amino acids, the levels of amino acids um, such as aspartate and glutamate are reduced in all these regions in, in the spinal cords of these ALS patients. Serine, BMAA mimics one amino acid specifically, and that's L-serine. And it basically, it's mistaking the toxin for the amino acid. So this toxic amino acid medicament is floating through the body, um, leading to new, further neurotoxicity. So there's a lot of scope for amazing amino acids, uh, D-serine and glycine, um, in in the motor neuron disease and ALS patients. Obviously, supporting GABA is also extremely important as well because that supports your muscarinic and adrenergic receptors. So GABA, GABA is often, um, deficiency of GABA is obviously associated. It's a relaxing hormone, so neurotransmitter. So it's involved when you see deficiencies, you'll see anxiety or, or, or craving alcohol, depression. And um, these some of the herbs that can be very useful in supporting the GABA and pathways, particularly in your NMDA, uh, N, M, ND patients are herbs, really good neuroprotective herbs such as passion flower, bacal skull cap, chamomile, kava, and so forth. Now, glutamate. MND is associated with excitotoxicity of glutamate. So what would you see? You'd see anxiety, insomnia, mania, etc. And some of the herbs that would be very useful to drive down that glutamate toxicity is our bacal skullcap and green tea or L-theanine. So using L-theanine and bacal skullcap together with L-serine would be a very good, based on this research, would be really um, amazing nutrients to apply to an MND patient. Glycine, we know, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, it protects tissue repair. It's involved in um, RNA and DNA. And so what we'll see is that there are five amino acids that tended to be elevated in the cerebrospinal fluid of it, these MND patients are isoleucine, glycine, alanine, phenylalanine, and threonine. So when you're uh, um, examining an MND patient with their amino acid status, which is usually measured either in blood or in uh, ser that serum or in urine, uh, the compounder would be able to compound based on this level of research.
Now, there are many, many vitamins and antioxidants that can also be used. Folic acid, your methylating cofactors are really, really important. Um, vitamin B6, B12, et cetera. But why? Because they are needed for the metabolism of those very amino acids. Uh, Selegiline, so these are no so nootropics. DHEA, which is a youthful hormone as well, could be useful there. So the physical supports, of course, there are light writers, there are various neck supports, the enteral tubal feeding, there's, there's ventilation support. All of these supports are available, but you might find that a patient might need anticholinergics such as hyacinth and amitriptyline, or they might have difficulty in um, swallowing. So they might have not only the anticholinergics, but also botulinum toxin, or also known as Botox. Traditional Chinese medicine has also been uh, shown to be beneficial. Uh, your intravenous um, astragalus root has uh, been uh, studied, as well as Bu Yong Tang. There's a number of herbs that can be used within TC as traditional Chinese medicine for MND. So the herbs that are useful for MND are, need to be neuroprotective. They need to have adaptogenic, nerving, calmative actions. And so the herbs that we're talking about here are lion's mane, withania, bacal skullcap, goda cola, and so forth. They need to have anti-inflammatory because it's an infl inflammation of the brain and inflammation of the nervous system. So anti-inflammatory herbs such as turmeric, uh, galangal, ginseng, and so forth would be useful. Immune-stimulating herbs, immune, immuno, immunomodulatory herbs such as cordyceps, reishi, astragalus, hemidesmus are really useful. So a herbalist would be able to compound a really great herbal um, strategy for an MND patient. So what are the other new innovations in MND? <coughs> Neural stem cells, they actually replace supporting cells. Stem cell transplants are more likely to be effective in protecting existing motor neurons more than acting in by rather than acting actually replacing or even repairing them. So the organizations such as Neural Stem, Neuron, Brainstorm, they are in various trials, phase two trials, where they've given injections of these stem cells to uh, some of these patients, and um, they are still to be published. There is a significant amount of um, research now being highlighted on the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We see elevations in pro-inflammatory cytokines in these MND patients, TNF-alpha. These are all your Th1 elevators. Cytokines such as interleukin-1, 6, 8. They are all involved in chronic autoimmune disease. Interleukin-6 can um, increase up to a thousand-fold during uh, a trauma or infection. So you can, you can use these growth factors to actually upregulate your circulating tumor cells, such as stem cells, such as your CD34. You need to downregulate the pro-inflammatory interleukin. So you need to downregulate IL-1, IL-6, IL-8, and TNF-alpha. Your sulfur-containing amino acids, such as N-acetylcysteine, is actually a really effective TNF alpha blocker, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha blocker, and it down regulates these pro inflammatory interleukins. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is used for hypoxia. Hypoxia is a lack of oxygen. It drives these hypoxia, lack of oxygen actually drives these pro inflammatory cytokines metabolism and it drives down mitochondrial respiration. In other words, your mitochondria cannot produce enough ATP. So there are various um, studies available on 
some commercially available products, cerebral lysin, it is actually a uh, intramuscular injection peptides and that has been used to stimulate neurotropic regulation of the central nervous system. So these peptides, there's a lot of study now being used and peptides are nothing but amino acids in an injectable form. Thymolysin is an actin sequestering protein it's found at high concentrations within the spleen, the thymus, and even the peritoneal macrophages where it's most responsible for organization of your skeletal muscle, muscular, uh, the cytoskeletal structure. So um, there's a lot of uh, study being done on the use of HBOT for, um, for really debilitating conditions, including your MND. Methylene blue has is an antioxidant. Now we know that it is. Um, it there, there's a number of studies now being shown that the it, it protects the brain. We know it as a dye, of course, but in actual fact, it is a, me, a medication which has anti-cancer and antimicrobial effects. Low doses of methylene blue protects the brain by acting um, as an antioxidant inside the mitochondria. So definitely be uh, um, aware of some of the newer products that are available on the marketplace. Um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy protects against mitochondrial dysfunction. It delays the onset. It ameliorates the mitochondrial dysfunction in the motor cortex and the spinal cord. And it, it really delays the onset of the disease um, of, of MND, particularly it's the studies have been done in wobbler mice. So genetics, there's some amazing genetics that have been um, identified as the study of genes are, are fairly rampant at the moment. TNF-alpha expressed by the glial cells and, and the neurons. So the sorts of um, genetics that we are seeing besides SOD um, and the various variants of these or alleles of these genes, Oh, also uh, TNF-R1 and TNF-R2. TNF-alpha is um, dynamically reduced uh, after hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, it, it actually, uh, uh, hyperbaric, just oxygen therapy. You remember when we breathe in, we're breathing up to about 20% of oxygen. When you're using hyperbaric, you're using close to 100% of oxygen. So, Oxygen increases in a leukin 18, uh, suggesting you know inflammation reduction of inflammation. Now there are people out there, there are practitioners and colleagues of um, mine that are out there. Deanna Protocol, uh, she, Dr. Deanna, is um, subscribes to what we call a metabolic therapy. So it involves really looking at a holistic or integrative model of approaching MND, um, aiming particularly at fueling the citric acid cycle intermediates, mainly alpha-ketoglutarate and also all the other uh, motor functions. Uh, and so the sorts of um, supplementation that would be used would be alpha-ketoglutarate, um, AAKG, which is arginine, uh, alpha-ketoglutarate, your GABA, CoQ10, niacin, 5-hydroxytryptophan, and don't forget the amino acids. There are many supportive therapies. There are non-invasive ventilation therapies. You know, you can have difficulty tolerating a face mask, so they might need other therapeutic exercises. They might need uh, various um, uh, added and adjunctive devices. There are many um, drugs that can be used to help with uh, uh, antispastics and, and uh, it may worsen the um, muscle function. So it, you, you need to use um, both pharmaceutical as well as natural therapies to help support the system. So I trust you enjoyed um, an overview of not only what motor neuron disease is all about, but some of the current concepts in the literature right now as we speak. Um, so definitely, if you have any questions, you're welcome to contact me and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.